Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual, global gathering of phenomenal women and those of you who love them. Yes, you, mothers, daughters, grand and great-grandmothers, fearsome and generous, humble and honest in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. You know we dig deep here, right? And we come up strong. For those of you joining us for the first time each month, we explore a new theme inspired by you. Yes, I said you. We bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us there's some things you just don't talk about, but not at this table. And no matter how hard judgment knocks, it cannot come in. Beloved here, we live beyond the wreckage. Every week, we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. Every week, we start right where we are. I am so excited about how the show is progressing. We are in our seventh month of proof that dreams can come true. Frankly speaking with Tyra G., as you know, is one of my most precious dreams. I thank God for every remembrance of you, your gift of ideas, your encouragement, and your presence. Those were the gifts that inspired me. You all know I can't do this without you, right? You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the Internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Should you miss us, no worries. You can catch up with us on our podcast. Just type in, Frankly Speaking, on YouTube with Tyra G. If you feel like connecting with me offline, y'all know how much I like that, right? It's easy. Just email me, Tyra at TyraGarlington.com. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song and for naming it, I'm Listening. This is Women's History Month. Our theme this month is Women of Wonder. Wow. I like to begin each show by sharing a few words of wisdom related to our topic by trailblazers who make us proud to be women. I have chosen for this month a few very special quotes, which I'm going to share with you, as well as a special message from our coach and friend, Ms. Van Sant, out of her book, Until Today. So I want you to listen up now. Our first message to all little girls who are watching, never doubt that you are valuable and powerful and deserving of every chance and opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve your own dreams. And that was Miss Hillary Clinton, Not after she won something, but after she lost. I want to remind you, it's not how many times you fall down, but how many times you get up. I'm tough. I'm, excuse me, I'm tough, I'm ambitious, and I know exactly what I want. And that's Madonna. There is no limit to what we as women can accomplish. That's Michelle Obama. And oh, by the way, I found one that's not from a woman, but from a fountain of wisdom. It is the head of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And he says, if you educate a man, you educate a man. If you educate a woman, you educate a generation. Now, although I say this month is Women's History Month, I think of each of us as women of wonder every day, all day, in all ways, always. And to create our common thought space today, here are a few words from our coach, Ms. Van Sant. But before, before, let me begin with an editorial comment. That is, life is a process. It is not an event. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. We come here with stuff and we leave stuff behind and that's okay. We must not judge ourselves by how many times we fall. As I said, it's how many times we get up. And now 
I begin the quote with, I am now receptive to the idea that when I get there, everyone will not be there. Okay, wow, women, check this out. If you really want to live your life to the fullest and realize your greatest potential, you must be willing to run the risk of making some people mad. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. They're going to get mad at you because whenever you move beyond someone's opinion of you, they get upset because you thought more of yourself than they thought of you. If you want to know just how much you can do, how far you can reach, how much you can stretch, you must be willing to leave some people behind. You must be willing to do more, be more, have more than those in your present company have. This does mean that you're going to be comparing yourself to others. But that's okay because you're not showing off. Oh, no, it means you're willing to step out on your own, to try life for yourself and claim your divine inheritance without guilt. Until today, you may have been holding on to others' opinions about you and doing your best to keep people with you and at your side. But just for today, take a risk. Tell somebody what you really want for your life. Tell someone you do not agree with their opinion of you. Then, jump into the center of your own life. And get comfortable being there. Your affirmation today is, Today I'm devoted to living my life without guilt and based on my own opinions. I'm going to say it again. Today I am devoted to living my life without guilt and based on my own opinions. So where do we get the courage to be who we are? Where did you get the courage to be who you are? To live at the speed of purpose. Maybe it's in your genes, and that's spelled G-E-N-E-S. I heard someone say to me, look, when you get married, it's not just you and your husband. It's your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, your great-grandmother, and everybody else that's in there. That's a whole community you come to the table with. And they contribute to you genetically. But I ask you, who are these people, and how do you find out? Well, I'm glad you asked. Have you ever wondered where you came from, your roots? Girl, you are not alone. Today, after our break, you're going to meet a woman of wonder who personifies curiosity, turned it into passion, and turned that into a lifelong uh, mission. She's going to enlighten us on the process of searching. Y'all stay close now. And we are back. This is going to be such a treat because it's not a conversation you have every day and for those of you our national listeners and our international listeners the centerpiece of our discussion today is going to focus on a geography called Alexandria Virginia uh, the African-American history there however the work that my guest does is not limited to that geography and I think you'll hear so much more about her scope I'd like for you to meet, and she has a great following, so let me put it this way. I'd like to present to some and to introduce to more Ms. Char McCargo Ba. Thank you, Tara, and thank you for inviting me to your show. Um, I started my genealogy back 37 years ago. Wow. And um, I started when Roots came out, and I was just really blown away. I never thought that African Americans could research their own people, especially if they were enslaved. Um, Though many people state that Alex Haley's story was somewhat fiction, um, because some people have tried to, you know, verify his information and found problems with it. Mm -hmm. But regardless whether it was fiction or not, he never said he was a genealogist. He said, I am a storyteller. Yes, he did. And therefore, um, he opened the possibility of African Americans researching their family. And that was enough for me. I was in college at the time, and I was working in a library one day for my finals, and I heard on a loudspeaker that it was a genealogical group starting for Black History Month. So Black History is extra special to me Uh because I found genealogy during that time. 
And I immediately closed my book and I went running down there and I listened <laughs> and I became one of their early members. It was the D.C. Genealogical Society and it was a stepchild to Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, the acronym AUG. Uh-huh. And um, Mr. James Den Walker started the um, AUGs and they spinned off from, um, from uh, AUGs and started this small, really like an interest group. And so I joined them, and it was like a romance that my husband has to compete with. I love it. <laughs> and so um, I um, started, and I and I um, one of the older members, Mrs. Greta Irby, um, became my mentor, and she held my hand through the process. And so at that time, it was no you know um, classes that one can take. You just go to um, conferences and. P- genealogical conferences and everything like that. And so Mrs. Irby became my mentor, and everything I would find, every night I got home from work, Miss Irby, Miss Irby, Miss Irby, guess what? Guess what I found? And she would go over and she said, honey, now you got to go and look at this, and honey, you got to go look <laughs> at that. And so I had on hand, um, hands-on process in learning genealogy. I was out in the field. I was at the courthouses. I was picking up the large books. I was traveling from from different places. I was going to the churches. I was going to the cemeteries. And all of this over the years, and the years went by fast. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I built up a niche and I built up a a specialty in doing genealogy. And of course, now you can go to classes. You can go, you know, you can um, go to institutes. There's many institutes on genealogy. And um, but for me at that time, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I started taking clients in 1990 and I did pro bono for about 90, 2000, 2000, about 20, 20, uh, 20 years. Yeah. From 1990 to 19, 2000, 2005, about 15 years, really. I started taking pro bono. And so what happened is that because my own research, mostly in Virginia, North Carolina, I wanted to know could I really do other states. I had outgrown many of the uh, many of the conferences I would go to. Mm-hmm. And my clients took me all over the world. I had clients in, in Texas, um, clients on the West Coast, East Coast, the South. And, um, and I did a pro bono, so I allowed myself to take my time, allow myself to learn the records, mm-hmm. and I became very good at it. And I and it specialized in, in, in slave research. And later on, I had a client that I was with him for ten years, and um, it was difficult because it was difficult getting rid of him. I said, you know, <laughs> we have to get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband was happy, wasn't he? <laughs> yes. I mean, his man would call me. He was a judge, and um, and so what happened? And he wanted to know about his family, and he thought his family had a very unusual story, and he thought he had gone with the wind. And I, I don't think it was all of that, but he thought so. Uh-huh. And I was with him for ten years, and um, he had a lot of freed blacks, and it, it amazed me that people who know that they have a slave background, in a sense that they know that people were brought here slaves, it's a lot of people who families were free, and they had no idea. You know what I want to do, and and. I'm so glad that you did this. Mm -hmm. Last night in my class, um, I'm taking a screenwriting Mm -hmm. class, and one of the things we were looking, the history of flamenco dancing, Mm -hmm. and the term enslaved, no, someone Mm -hmm. said they were slaves. Mm -hmm. And my teacher said, if you don't learn anything else, Mm -hmm. please understand Mm -hmm. any population Mm -hmm. that was held by another was enslaved. And you use that term, and I want our listeners to understand there's a differentiation, and I just want to thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Yes. Yeah, so anyway, um, in the process of knowing that your people were enslaved, most of us just assume, mm-hmm. you know, especially if you've been here, you know, um, six generations, you mm-hmm. assume. Okay, but a lot of people, a lot of my clients, usually end up with one line of their family being free who were never in slavery. Mm-hmm. And um and the conditions could be different. Um, they um they could have purchased their their freedom at one time, but in many cases, it's usually uh where one of their ancestors, especially, is the female that is a it is is um the female is a white female who had a child with a with a slave or with a freed black. Hmm. Now, in some cases, where the slave owner had a a child. 
and he was fond of him for some reason, he might have emancipated him. But mm-hmm. many times is that many of the free uh, people that I have researched, many of the free African Americans usually have a white ancestor that is a female, and that's how they were free because you're the condition of your mother, not okay. the condition of your father. Okay, everybody, did you hear that? Okay, condition of your mother. Yes, because if your mother is free, then they call it issues. If she had any children, they call them issues. Her children would be free. Mm-hmm. If the father is is free. And your mother's a slave, you are a slave. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and that's how the system worked. Okay, all right. Now, um, this this judge, uh, I know you got a divorce, but was he kind of the example? In other words, if I came to you and I said, "Char, um, how do we start a relationship, you and mm-hmm. I?" and is it normal that we would have a relationship for years? Um, not really. Um, I. It, Tell you when he approached me, I didn't want to take him, um, because of his, his profession. I thought he would be overbearing, and I was correct. Okay, okay? Uh-huh. so I, I had preconceived ideas about him, and mm-hmm. it, it worked out. Yes, I was right on the money with that. Mm-hmm. And what happened is that um, he was a criminal judge, senior ah, judge, okay. and he was retired, and he was used to getting everything now, 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 now. And so what happened is that um, I was working full time and then I got involved with a big, big project, which was the Freeman Cemetery Project in Alexandria, where um, doing. I, I want you to talk about okay. that separately. Okay. 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 So anyway, yeah. so I got involved in certain things that uh-huh. my time was tight. OK. And he's told me that it's, it w- he was not going to take no for an answer. Yes. And so I let him talk me into it. I kept kicking myself every every possible way. But anyway, I was able to get him back to the early 1700s. Wow. And so um, his family was free and, 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 and enslaved. Okay. What happened is that the men fell in love with enslaved women. Ah. His family had, uh, had an ancestor that was, um, that was already free. I don't know how she got her freedom, but uh-huh. she was free as far back as seven in the 1700s before the Revolutionary War. Okay. Now, she could have been a child of a white female. I'm not too sure. Uh-huh. But um, so, and they came from five different counties in in, in um, Virginia. Um, she, was a, she was a child, his oldest ancestor was a child that was in an orphan, orphanage. I mean, her parents were deceased. So mm-hmm. the, um, the church had uh, jurisdiction over that. So what they did, they kind of, uh, apprenticed her out oh, until she came of age. Okay. And then when she had her own children, they were free because she was free. Got it. And so, and she apprenticed her own children out because regardless, um, African Americans prior to the slave period really didn't have a childhood. They expected them to work. Got it. And so so when you say apprentice them out, what you're saying is they work. Yes. Okay. And right. sometimes they'd be five years old. Yeah. They didn't yeah. have, they didn't have, they didn't have a childhood like, you know, like um, the white Americans did. Mm-hmm. So if you had uh, you had children and they were and you were free, then the courts, even somebody would report you mm-hmm. and say that these children are do not they are not working. The courts will have you come in and mm-hmm. you would be doing that. OK. And so it's kind of, you know, sad, but they really don't have a childhood. OK. And if you are a slave, I mean, enslaved, then of course, you know, you're working. Yes. You yes. Know. Yes. So if I said, OK, Char. Listen, um, how do I engage you uh, and how long can I expect it to take for you to do X? Okay. When I used to take clients, I don't take clients like I used to. When I used to take clients, first I sit down and have a conversation. You have to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that conversation might be very painful and tearful. So we do our crying and whatever we got to do and get it out of our system. Mm -hmm. And they're usually going to tell me what they want want me to do, whether they want me to locate a missing person, a relative, whether they want me to do their genealogy and how far. Uh And most African-Americans want to get back to the motherland. And I usually tell them, I say, honey, you'll get there after me. But um, but most of them want to get back there. And DNA has made it possible for them to know exactly what ethnic group they came from or yes, whatever. Yes, yes. But what, you have this big gap. You don't have the research. 
you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what happened is that it's based on the individual. I um, have located many missing people and people families. Mm-hmm. I've done that, and I have done people genealogy as well. Um, so once we determine what you want, mm-hmm. and I and then I do a, I um, usually ask them for a, a, a deposit. Mm-hmm. And then I do a preliminary. Out of that preliminary, then I can tell you how long it can take me. Okay. Whether the records are available. Okay. If you're in Virginia, that's no problem because I'm because because of you know because I live in you know I can do Virginia. But when you're talking about people in Texas or yeah, Alabama, the cost is greater. Yes. Um, not only cost is greater, but uh, it's more difficult. For instance, I'm in Virginia. Virginia vital statistic records started in 1853. Mm-hmm. Um, Alabama, they started in the 20th century, their their ah. vital statistics. So where I can probably tell you that ancestor was born in slavery, I can tell you, if he was born in 1854, I can tell you that. Uh-huh. I can't tell you when he was born, if I go back, back to vital statistics, if he was born in Alabama. Gotcha. Because... They didn't start their vital statistics until the 20th century. Now, you know what? I, first of all, what you're saying to me mm-hmm. is so significant because when we sat down, when I first contacted you, it wasn't in my head that I would have a choice. Mm-hmm. Like you said, I may want you to locate a specific relative or I may want my geneal- genealogy or mm-hmm. I may want it to a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm hearing now some depth in it's just not a word Mm -mm. it is a process that has all it's a tree Mm -hmm. a tree trunk that has all kinds of uh, limbs and leaves to it I guess that's that can Mm -hmm. work (laughs) (laughs) but um, okay so this is all good yes and sometimes um, a lot of my cases I have a niche for some reason I have a niche in locating people who are missing leaves on your tree okay Okay. yeah and uh, for instance Everybody has drama in their family. I don't care how proper, how elite or whatever. They got somebody in their family really had drama. Yeah. And most times um, that caused families to split. Okay. And uncle left home and never nobody never knew where he where he um, ended up and mm-hmm. he never communicated. Mm-hmm. And sometimes what person would approach me and say, well, I know my mother had a brother. And um and he left home and we don't know why and um I don't know whether he's still living or whatever. Okay. And that's what they are hiring me for. Okay. And so then I get as much information about the family. I go through, um you know possible you know th- uh, ways. I look at the migration of the individual family. Okay. And that's usually a very big clue because what happened is that if you had a cousin, if your if your uncle had a cousin that went up to Chicago. Yeah. Chances are that might have been one of his first stops. The reason why, when um, when you're looking at, I was born doing segregation, mm-hmm. and I was started school, and my elementary was segregated, mm-hmm. my, high, my middle school was integrated. If you traveled back in that time, it was very few black hotels. Exactly. So yeah. you had to go someplace where you had family and friends. Yes. So when you were researching somebody in that period of time, chances are, who in their community, who my first question. Who were your uncle's friends? Can your okay. mother tell me that? Okay. And you tell me what? Uh, what? What about your other relatives? Did anybody go north? Okay. And and usually they tell me, and usually I will find them exactly where that migration of, of that community went, or that migration of that family went. Okay. So uh, more keywords. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, understanding what the world was like mm-hmm. in terms of race yes. during certain centuries and generations. Yes. And I remember the, uh, well, at least reading about the Green Book yes. that told you where you could go, where you could eat, where you could eventually drive, get gas, et cetera. I remember uh, when I was little, there was an African-American hotel mm-hmm. where all the social stuff was. Yes. So... Uh, there was an underlying conversation yes. that happened if you wanted to survive as you moved about the country among mm-hmm. African Americans. Yes. Okay. But that is for people who had money. I got you. Okay. I got you. Now, my parents migrated from Halifax County, Virginia, which mm-hmm. is on the borderline of North Carolina near Greensboro and um, Caswell County. Okay. They migrated here 
And then when they when they came to Alexandria, my parents got married, and our house was a place where my dad's friends and our relatives would come to when they're migrating. Okay. So when they left, they would come with a suitcase and maybe not even fifty cent in their pocket. Mm-hmm. And my well, my my dad would put them up mm-hmm. and take them on his job. And then they would get a job, and they're there for maybe four or five months, and then they're able to get their own, usually rent a room, because they would go home every two weeks to their family. They uh-huh. would never bring their wives with them. Uh-huh. The wife and the children would stay. They'll come up to get work, and they'll go home every two two weeks. You wouldn't find them using the, the using the uh, Green Book. Okay. You, you wouldn't find them using that because the simple fact they didn't have money. You exactly. Know what I'm saying? Exactly. And um, they would have enough just to get on that uh, Greyhound bus to make it to wherever they're going. So, so also... Doing genealogy, you would know uh, actually really the wealth of the people that you're researching. You Excellent. immediately know that. And so you know, okay, they didn't have any money, so they had to go Got it. someplace. Yeah. So it's a lot of analyzing in it. And that's what makes the difference in the genealogists yeah. is that, yes, they have experience, but are they, do they have an analytical mind? And, you know, I'm also, okay, so we've talked about class. Mm-hmm. We've talked about enslavement. Uh, we've talked about the ability to survive. Yes. We've talked about the importance of family yes. and friends. Um, and I guess what I what I want to underline is we're broadening what that concept means. And for African Americans, we're digging deep. Yes. Because most people are not having these kind of conversations, Char. They don't know. No. And when you sit there and talk to them, they do know, but it's deep in them. They don't know it. Gotcha. Like I have a conversation with them. I said, well, what did your grandfather do? Oh, well, he was a farmer, but he had a little store. Okay. There's more money there. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, do you know um, what church he went to? Yeah, he, he, he was a he, he was a, um, a Methodist. Uh-huh. Chances are anybody migrated, they're going to be going, looking for a Methodist church. Right, right, right. Uh-huh. You know, so you all these are clues, but you got to know how to analyze it, uh-huh. flesh it out of them, and be able to use that in the research process. Um, like, you know, I, I had one client, you know, they said she was telling me about her, um, one of her relatives. He liked to party. Oh, he loves the party, party, party. Mm-hmm. And he left and nobody knew. Well, the biggest party places during that period of time in in the, in the fifties, you're going to go to Chicago or you're going to go to New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, they, you know, they had the, the you know, the black, the black life there was mm-hmm. well developed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had places in Baltimore too, but and sure enough, he ended up in Chicago. Okay, you know, so you know, you you you, just, you have to know African American history. Yes, you have to know the geography. Yes, you have to know the economical status of the individual. You got to know the culture of the people. Um, had um, somebody approached me from Louisiana, and I really don't do Louisiana research. And the reason why is they have a distinct culture. And if you're going to do research on them in 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 Louisiana, you're going to have to understand it one way or another. You're going to have to learn that you're going to come across records that might be in another language, like gotcha. French or something like that. Yeah. So I leave that to the Louisiana people. But if they want to hire me to find find somebody who left Louisiana, then I can help them. Okay. <laughs> so so in the case with um, this particular person, that's what they wanted. They wanted to find this individual that they had in their family. Um, it was not really their family. It was that it was their mother first love. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And evidently, she believed that her mother first love was her father and not the father who raised her. Gotcha. So anyway, come to find out, Louisiana, people from uh, um, from Louisiana, they have a, a very distinct culture, and she was born in the forties. Okay, and he and he left, and so I felt that, and she had clues that he could have gone to Chicago or he could have gone to Baltimore. Okay, and um, he ended up in Chicago also, and. He and I found him living in an area where it was other people from Louisiana. Gotcha. The Creole, mm-hmm. the food, the culture, mm-hmm. the, the the high life, all of that was right there in that community. Uh-huh. And he was known to be a a person who loved the high life. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so it's that's knowing the people and knowing 
don't take for granted just because you're African American, you all have the same experiences. You have all the same culture. You do not. Say it again. Say it again. Not all African Americans have the same culture and the same experiences. Yes, even if you come from an enslaved background, mm -hmm. it was a difference. You know, um, when you were brought from the motherland, mm -hmm. they didn't pick one tribe. They pick, they went they went about getting slaves from all different type of tribes, enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And so you bring that with you. Your culture comes with you. Mm -hmm. My husband is from Sierra Leone. You cannot take the culture out. You can change the location. Yes. But you cannot take the culture out. So what happened is that sitting down with a person and, 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 and getting to learn their culture, getting mm -hmm. to understand their culture, mm -hmm. and being able to analyze and take every piece of information they give you as clues because mm -hmm. it fits a puzzle. Yes, It is yes. a puzzle and it fits. Yes. And uh, especially if you've got common names. Yeah, yeah. How are you going to tell one Leroy Smith from another Leroy Smith? You got to draw up your description. You have to, you know, develop that character. Okay, leave this Leroy has a gap uh -huh. in his mouth. Uh -huh. This other Leroy, no. You know, you have to know enough about that Leroy. And Leroy, um, you know, his mother name was so and so. When you find Leroy, his first daughter's probably named one of his children will be named after his mama because he was a mama's boy. You know, so you got to know. I love how, this. You got I, to have I, to know. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And and something you said before mm -hmm. I go to break, mm -hmm. you said, uh, like, um, I'm sure they told you, mm -hmm. but do you get images? Do, do people provide you with any kind of photos yes. ever? Usually we have photos. Uh, sometimes they do not have photos. Mm -hmm. But when they describe the person, you see him. Okay. You come in contact. I, it's a spiritual part, too, to genealogy. Okay. And that... Um, um, and we might talk about this when we talk about the cemetery, but yes. it's, it's a spiritual part of genealogy that that I go through, and I don't know whether everybody has the same experience. I know my little my little my friend group, my genie friends, <laughs> many of them do have the same experience okay. I have, and um, and it's like you know you got it, you know you you know the person so well, so when you find them, you know you got them. It's no it's no it's no problem. You know you have them. You did all your research. You're feeling them. Okay. Just, you know, you know when you hit it, you hit it. Yeah. But it's a spiritual part that I believe that the ancestors want us to find them. They want us to tell their story because we we are the only ones that can tell their story. I listen, I am I'm sitting here mm -hmm. grinning. Mm -hmm. For those of you who can't see me, I'm sitting here grinning. Mm -hmm. And Char, um, I love the fact that you said, Hey, first of all, Tyra, it's the ability to analyze. Mm -hmm. It's also the ability to empathize. Mm -hmm. And you said you're looking at history, you're looking at geography, you're mm -hmm. looking at culture, you're looking at economics, mm -hmm. and you're looking at the spiritual quality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then I, I'm going to use, I don't know when I'm going to use it, maybe in one of my blogs, The Missing Leaves of the Tree. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a very short break because there's a ton of stuff mm -hmm. for us to talk about. Yeah. So um, we will be right back, y'all. Grab a snack. Mm -hmm. Stay close. And we are back. We are having us a delicious time. Uh, Char has been walking us through the experience of discovering where we came from. And we have talked about the many ways or the many questions people present to her. Uh, I want to find this person missing. I want to know where I came from. I want to know blah, blah, blah. And what I have learned and I am so proud of is uh, it's not one question. It's many. Uh, an effective African-American genealogist is going to be a great uh, analyzer of information and asking wonderful questions. So I want to continue because there's some very specific topics mm -hmm. that um, I want us to talk about. Um, we've got one about a cemetery. We've got one about Civil War. Mm -hmm. So you can pick uh, any one of five or six. We've got... Mm, maybe 10 minutes so you can break us up and, and mm -hmm. give us some specific requests and things you've discovered. Would you do that? Yes. Back in uh, 2008, the city of Alexandria um, approached me to see whether uh, it was possible to find descendants of a Civil War cemetery that is located at um, um, Washington Street and Church Street in Alexandria, Virginia. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I had previously worked on the, a project when they discovered it it was a cemetery. I joined a group called the Friends of the Freedom Cemetery, and we were able to work with the city and the developers and um, Congressman Moran and set aside $2 million for a memorial after they finished working on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, which is directly underneath the cemetery on, on the uh, highway. Mm-hmm. Um, what, the amazing thing about that um, cemetery, when they offered me, asked me could I come in there talk to me and without interest and I said yes I hung up the phone and I said oh god I just went to heaven and I'm in genie heaven and it was like (laughs) I was like so happy Uh, you know one of the high points in my uh, genealogical career Um, they have been looking for African Americans that were in the city of Alexandria for over 20 years and found only one family which was the Lightfoot family Okay, and they they weren't too sure whether it was possible. So uh, we have the names of the people who are buried there. Most of them, the infant children, just were they were buried as infants and not with a first name. Mm-hmm. But, but at least a great deal of the people who are buried there, which is eighteen over eighteen hundred people. Wow! And we have their um, we have their um, basically we have their, their their full names. Two weeks later, by the time I could get to the meeting, I have already found four descendants. And they said, well, how do you do it? I, you know, and I, I feel my life in genealogy and how I approach it is like a hound dog. <laughs> I go after it until Can I, we just call it passion? <laughs> no, I go after it like a hound dog. <laughs> and so I determined, I mean, I was working full time for the federal government. I had not retired. Mm-hmm. And I worked full time for the city on this project. Going to bed at midnight, getting up at 3, 15 in the morning to get ready for my day job. And your husband stayed. Uh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> we, we, we had to make appointments with each other. So, <laughs> so what happened is that um, what I found out in the process with this one, I, I knew it existed, but it, it was more, I noticed it more in this project is that a spiritual thing came over me. And I'll be working in the research places like in Alexandria, Virginia, um, they, at the library in Alexandria on Queen Street, they have a local history and a special collection of local history. And a lot of Alexandra's history is there. And I went to Richmond, Virginia, to the Library of Virginia, which is the archives of Virginia. It's mm-hmm. just all over the place. An overwhelming feeling comes over. And I could be looking, I said, but I can't find anything. And all of a sudden, a book will fall. And I'll pick it up, and i look. It's what I'm looking for. Wow. It's like the ancestors were waiting, and they wanted someone to tell their story. And um, I was able to locate 169 of those deceased people. I found their descendants. And in 2014, well, once I found them, I wrote up the report, and um, the city had a a dedication ceremony. It was a week long. And they said, Charlie, you think they're going to come? I said, hey, they, I said, they're going to be here. Believe yeah. me, they're going to be here. Now, they were talking about the 169 that you had found. The deceased pe- people, the people who were buried there, I found their descendants, which okay. taken into the thousands. Oh, okay. And so it was approximately all week long. I don't know what the final tally was, but it was anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people were there for that week. Oh, they, were, they were coming in. Not everybody came to the banquet, but a lot of them came to the dedication on that Saturday. Mm-hmm. They came with tears. We had that. we had a pre pre ceremony that March of 2014, uh-huh. and where um, they had uh, Howard University gospel singers come, and they had a ceremony for them. And it was snowing and ice. They said, "Well, we don't know we're going to be. They're going to have." I think the auditorium held like 300 people. It was packed. I believe it. And they said we they never thought that the city would do this for them. They had ill feelings about the city of Alexandria and uh-huh. because, you know, our history is painful. Yes. And yes, painful yes. things were done to us in our history. Yes. So so what happened is that they really didn't have too much faith in Alexandria. But after the dedication, mm-hmm. they were all right with Alexandria. Now, I want to I want to say again, Friends of Freedmen Cemetery. Yes. That was the organization, Mm -hmm. and the city of Alexandria inducted you or recruited you Mm -hmm. to do the research, and you found 1,800... No, 1,800 people are buried there. Yeah, are buried there. I found 169 of the deceased people. Okay. Deceased people, I found their descendants. 
Okay. All right. All right. So mm-hmm. that's another wow. Yeah. And then the city stepped up and celebrated this history. Yes. And <laughs> and it was a banquet and people were like, they never thought it would happen. And all of the bad feelings and all of what they've been through over the um, um, the century, it was put to rest then. Well, may I just say, you are a woman of wonder, Char. Mm-hmm. Just thinking how many lives you touched, it was your passion, but it was there for a reason. Yeah. And, and okay, so I know we're running out of time. Okay, so um, <laughs> give, pick another one. Okay, uh, when did this happen? I think it was in 1996 or 1997. I get an email from a German citizen. Okay. And he was taking a course at the university in Germany, and he was telling the professor that, he has been looking for his World War II father. Yeah. And he was he was born in 1947 himself. And he said his father was a, a African-American GI. Okay. And he wanted to know how could he find him. He'd been looking for him for, you know, like, you know, close to 30-something years. Mm-hmm. And so the professor was a, um, okay, the professor him, uh, herself, she was a uh, scholar from the U.S. Okay. So she told him, you need to get a genealogist. Mm-hmm. And she showed him how to go online to look for genealogists in Virginia, and I was one of them. And to make a long story short, unknown to me and unknown to him, we huh. were first cousins. What? He first cousins, second cousins, second, co- second cousins. cousins, second cousins, cousins, second, cousins. Yes. <laughs> um, because his father is my great uncle, and I knew that my uh, great uncle was in World War II. I had no idea he left a child behind. He had no idea I was his father's uh, niece. What did that feel like? Oh, I almost had a heart attack again. Another genie heart attack I had almost. Yeah. And um, what happened is that I started to turn him down. I wasn't going to take him because his father's name is James Clark. My great uncle's name James Clark. But it's so common, any Clarks, you're going to find a James or John. Okay. That I thought I could not help him. But again, spiritually, something came over me. Yeah. And when he told me he he loved um, James Baldwin's writings, I said, oh, that's my favorite writer. He said, I like Lou Ross. I said, oh, me, oh my God, I love uh, Lou Ross. He said, I'm a social worker. I said, my, my daughter's a social worker. He said, I'm born in 1947. I said, I'm born in 1957. I said, I'll take you. <laughs> so I took him oh, based Char. on that feeling yeah. that so many little things can, you know, connect. Why did he have to say James Baldwin, one of my favorite besides Maya Angelou? Why did he have to say that I was a social worker? Why did he have to say all of that meant something to me? So yeah, I yeah. did it. It took me one week. And I knew he was my relative because he said his father lived, um, his father uh, lived on Early Street in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh-huh. And he, he did not know the address. Well, my great uncle, sister, lived at on Early Street. And when I looked her up, I found James living with her in 1941 before he went into the military. Now, I, I just have one question. I, I can... Imagine, hmm. I, I I can't identify. I can imagine hmm. what. How did he respond quickly? Just tell me. How. I called him at three in the morning when I found out, uh-huh. and um, we never talked on the phone because we were emailing all the time. And he finally answered the phone, and I said, "This is Char, and y'all, y'all, y'all." <laughs> I said, "Um, this is the genealogist, y'all." I said, "I found your dad." Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I said, "But he's deceased," because I knew my, uh-huh. I knew I had did the research on my uh-huh. uncle. And I said, but you got a lots of cousins, lots of cousins. Aww. He said, I got cousins? I said, yes. I said, I'm one of them. <gasps> he said, what? He started crying. I said, Harold, I said, I'm paying for this call. You got to stop that crying. You, <laughs> you cry on your dime, not mine. <laughs> so he came and spent 17 days with us. And I took him oh, up and down. Char. I took him up and down. Now, that type of research I did was very detailed. Mm-hmm. Out of my pocket, mm-hmm. I didn't charge him. Mm-hmm. Out of my pocket, it was over ten thousand dollars. But you got psychic income, stuff, yes. stuff that will, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I have to interrupt you because I gave you an assignment. Yes, you did. And <laughs> uh, I'd like for you to um, carry out your assignment. Okay. I ask everyone to uh, spend a couple of three minutes mm-hmm. uh, reading a letter they've written to themselves. Mm-hmm. Would you do that for us yes. now? Yes. Thank you, mm-hmm. dear Char. This is a rare opportunity to connect to myself when I was young. 
The advice to myself as a child is that time is so precious. That life is like a road map with many turns, detours, one-way streets, highways, byways, and dead ends. Although I have always had a map of my life, but I did not always stay focused. If I could redo my life, I would be a little more driven, a little more focused, and I will have mapped out my life with a little more attention to the details to avoid some of the detours. In all the highs and lows of life, I have very little regrets. I got to live my life my way on my clock. For the younger self, I was wiser than I knew, and I gave thanks to my elders who led who laid the foundation for my older self. They always had my back. Thank you. You know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here and I, I'm emotionally um, hmm, moved. Mm-hmm. Emotionally moved. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm grateful to you. Mm-hmm. I want you to, I just have a feeling that there are going to be some people that want to know more about you. Could you tell them how, if they want to, how to reach you and the name of this book I happen to be holding in my hand? Okay, thank you. Um, you can reach me through my um, web, uh, my blog, and my blog is www.findingthingsforyou.com. Again, www.findingthingsforyou, all one word, Dot com. Awesome. And the name of the book I'm holding? And the name of the, of the book. Um, this book was um, printed in 2013 uh, by History Press, and it's also on Amazon.com. And it's about 62 people in Alexandria that we focus on who made a difference to people uh, in the African-American community in Alexandria. The book is called African Americans of Alexandria, Virginia, Beacons of Light in the 20th Century. And later this year, I will also have my second book completed, and that book is on the Freedman Cemetery. Awesome, awesome, mm-hmm. awesome. And you know what I like is we are storytellers. Mm-hmm. We are born to tell our story. And many of us who have been enslaved, stories were the only way we could keep our history alive. So I, mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for giving mm-hmm. and sharing your soul and your spirit and your passion. Mm-hmm. I have had several people ask me to read this poem that I've been reading all month uh, for our spiritual doggy bag. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's by Sarah Kay, and it's called The Type. And it's to encourage all of us to continue to be wonderful, wonderful women of wonder. Uh, And it begins, everybody needs a place. It shouldn't be inside someone else. If you grow up the type of woman men want to look at, you can let them look at you. Don't mistake eyes for hands or windows or mirrors. Let them see what a woman looks like. Many of them may not have seen one before. If you grow up the type of woman men want to touch, then let them touch you. Sometimes it's not you they're reaching for. Sometimes it's a bottle, a door, a sandwich, a Pulitzer, another woman. But his hands found you first. Do not mistake yourself for a guardian or a muse or a promise or a victim or a snack. You're a woman, skin and bones, veins and nerves, hair and sweat. You're not made of metaphors, nor apologies, nor excuses. Woman, if you grow up the type of woman that men want to love, you can let them love you. Being loved is not the same as loving. When you fall in love, it's discovering the ocean after years of puddle jumping. It's realizing that you have hands. It's reaching for the tightrope when the crowds have all gone home. Do not spend time wondering if you're the type of woman men will hurt. If he leaves you with a car alarm heart, you may learn to sing along. It's hard to stop the ocean even after it has left you gasping salty. Forgive yourself the decisions you've made, the ones you still call mistakes when you tuck them in at night. And know this, You're the type of woman who's looking for a place to call yours. Let the statues crumble. You've always been the place. You're a woman who can build it herself. 
you were born to build. I want to add my own encouragement to that and remind you that when you're in doubt of who you are, check your label. You're not a markdown. You're a designer's original. God has set your value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Surround yourself with people who will remind you of that very fact. You're not alone. You're not your circumstances. Nothing that's happened to you, the good, the bad, will ever be wasted. You have everything you need to thrive. Say yes to the power within you. Your seat at the table is guaranteed. I look forward to hearing from you again over the week, and I hope to be talking with you next week, same time, same place. You've been listening to Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. My guest has been Miss Char McCargo Fox. Thank you. Thank you.